Uh, welcome back from lunch. Um, hope to not overly bore you with a talk about all the cr wicked and interesting ways in which technology is influencing Africa's security landscape. Um, before I begin, I'd like to give a, a brief roadmap. Yeah, next next slide, please. So I'm going to do want to do three things as part of this topic. I want to talk to you about what I see as the continent's most significant ICT-enabled threats. Um, I'm going to talk about what I see as the status of current government and security sector responses, both some of the successes, challenges, and lessons learned. And I'm going to meditate a little bit about what I think the implications of the spread of ICT is for you as security sector actors. But before we get there, uh, I want to take a little bit of time to offer you all some historic perspective on the era we're living in. Um, 50 years ago, in 1974, say, um, even the most inventive criminal mastermind could not have imagined stealing millions of dollars from people they'd never met in countries they'd never been without ever having to leave their home. A captain of a container ship could never have imagined how a global system of satellites would help them unload cargo, nor how an invisible attack on the systems that these satellites depended on might cause region-wide shipping to come to a halt. Nor could a decorated ace pilot foresee that an era was coming in which his role might be usurped by a machine that could see farther, react faster, and did not suffer from exhaustion or fatigue. In 2024, 50 years later, this future is not an imaginary one. It has, both in Africa and across the rest of the world, arrived. Um, and when I've given this talk before, I've tried to make the case to African government and security sector officials that the strategic consequences of the spread of I I ICT would be, would be very large. Um, I, I think they already are large, and I would argue that, in fact, we're already seeing the spread of ICT have just as significant consequences for global geopolitics, for conflict, and for warfare in Africa and across the world as things like the horse, the cannonball, or firearms, or fossil fuels. Um, and in fact, what is even, I think, more mind-boggling, uh, next slide, please, is that we live in an era where digital and communications-based technologies are still relatively young and rapidly evolving. Um, as you can see from, from this chart, it took really hundreds of years for the firearm to displace longbows and pole arms in becoming the weapon of choice for modern infantry. And just like it would be really uh, folly to judge the long-term strategic impact of a firearm by comparing the matchlock rifle to a longbow, in many if not most instances the longbow had better range, was more precise, was a better technology at its time, um, I think the particularly scary and interesting thing about modern ICT technologies is in many ways they're still young, they're rapidly evolving, and they're only just beginning to become fully integrated and adopted into military strategy, operations, and tactics. And so I think what matters for you all from now on isn't so much debating about whether or not the digital revolution is going to have an impact. It's, it's how you're going to cope with its effects that it's having right now. Okay, next slide. So, so what, what, are, what are some of these effects? Um, I, I don't think that the, the kinds of challenges and threats that you see across the African continent are all that different from the rest of the world, though they may vary from country to country, region to region. Um, I would categorize the types of threats as more or less uh, fivefold. Um, so first and, and foremost, and probably the threat that you are most familiar with, is the threat from organized cyber-enabled crime. Um, I think that, that the spread of information and communications technology is changing the threat from, from crime in Africa three broad ways. Um, it's led to new forms of cybercrime. Um, it, it is changing the networks and markets for traditional organized crime like drug trafficking, like arms sales and human smuggling. A lot of the transactions are now done online through social media networks, through messaging, through that kind of thing. And it is also changing how organized criminals within and without Africa are financing themselves, be it through online transactions, fraud, or cryptocurrency. And I think the, the biggest area in which 
digitization is, is changing the landscape for crime is in the world of digitally enabled fraud and theft of various kinds from simple romance or phishing scams to much more complex uh, poly transnational business email compromise networks, which are largely based in Africa, but according to the US FBI, have caused some $40 billion worth of damages over the, over the past five years. Um, that we're seeing increasingly uh, uh, digitized networks of cyber criminals comprise the predominant threat in terms of fraud um, in Africa and across the world. And it's going to get even worse. Um, last year, uh, shortly after the chat GPT algorithms became popular, generative AI became popular, um, I, but I believe one of the first cases of AI-enabled impersonation occurred when the AU chairman, Musa Faki, was impersonated by cyber criminals. And they used a fake address to, extend, to establish meetings between Musa Faki and senior European Union officials. They had these meetings, and they used AI-enabled deep fakes and video technology to impersonate the AU chairperson. And this turned out to be just sort of a prank, but you can imagine what the kind of consequences might have been had this been an intelligence agency or somebody with a little bit more nefarious ends in mind. Um, which leads me to my second uh, here category of, of, of threat, of cyber threat. And that comes from espionage, which is where malicious actors use malware or create backdoors in a network's physical infrastructure with the intention of, of stealing sensitive information. I think over the past two decades, we've seen information technology fundamentally transform the field of espionage and intelligence, um, both from uh, the proliferation of cheap malware and surveillance technology, as well as open source intelligent methods, which through the use of satellite networks, social media, et cetera, now give small organizations and individuals the capability to understand their, their threat environment, the landscape they live in, that was previously only available to uh, uh, states. Um, you know, until I, I think in the story of the 2010s, you had some reporting about how African Union information systems and networks were compromised by external actors such as China, leveraging their control over the continent's um, information technology infrastructure. That is still, I think, a, a very, very big concern. I know a concern I hear from a lot of different colleagues I speak to about Africa's technology dependence on the rest of the world. But I think the story we're seeing emerging in, in, the, in the 2020s is how the proliferation of cheap kinds of malware and surveillance technology is really being used across the state by powers of all kinds, entities of all kinds, for surveillance and espionage purposes. Um, the best example of this is the spread of the uh, uh, NSO group, uh, an Israeli firm company's Pegasus malware, which is a kind of malware that gives the attacker the ability to compromise basically any kind of phone. Not only that, um, it does it so much without so much as a click. Basically, you get sent a message on WhatsApp or whatever, you're infected, you're done. Um, and there's been some reporting on, on the spread of this malware that found that numerous countries in Africa were using this malware, not only as was commonly reported in the news media to potentially spy on political opposition and, and distance, but also for active interstate espionage. There were governments in Africa that were using this malware to spy on heads of state of other African governments and using it to spy on heads of state not located in Africa. Um, and I think the 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 the, the Really, really big strategic consequences there. I don't, this, this malware is only going to get cheaper, more available, potentially more sophisticated. All right. Um, third cyber-enabled threat comes from critical infrastructure sabotage. Um, all over the continent, we're seeing critical infrastructure systems from ports to energy systems to government networks to the financial sector increasingly reliant on digital services or digitized systems to enable their functioning. That can be very, very valuable. That can add a lot of growth and potential for efficiency, but that also can leave you extremely vulnerable to cyber attacks. Um, two really, really good examples I'd like to illustrate just from the past couple of years 
Uh, one, there was a group known as Anonymous Sudan, which is based in Sudan, but probably has linkages with the Russian cyber criminal underworld that conducted uh, denial of service attacks against both the gov against both the countries of, of Kenya very successfully in one case and Nigeria unsuccessfully in the other case. And I, I, think, I think the Kenyans, it, it wasn't incredibly damaging, but what, what it did over the course of a couple days was completely shut down uh, or, or degrade mobile payment networks and government services, which the Kenyans had just put online. So people couldn't do things like apply for a passport, get a ticket, those kinds, those, those kinds of things. Um, um, so we can talk a lot about creating digital infrastructure and creating digital goods and services, but if you don't protect them, it then becomes a very, very big vulnerability. Um, fourth threat uh, comes from what I would call combat innovation. And this is the internet, social media, communications technology are fundamentally changing how both state and non-state armed actors recruit, finance themselves, organize, and commit violence. And this is very relevant in Africa, I think more so than, than people realize. Uh, two, I think, really good examples, um, Al-Shabaab, uh, one of Africa's longest running insurgencies, was also one of the world's first uh, insurgent groups to make use of Twitter, which it did to devastating effect when it live tweeted its attack against the Westgate Mall in Kenya in 2014. Um, also, in 2021, uh, the UN alleges that the world's first known use case of an autonomous weapon occurred not in Europe or the United States, but during the armed conflict in Libya, when a Turkish-made uh, Cargo 2 military drone um, lost connectivity with the operator and used autonomous systems to select, engage, and engage retreating logistics forces belonging to the warlord Khalifa Haftar. And there's some debate about among experts about like what constitutes an autonomous weapon and what, what doesn't, but it is clear that autonomous weapons are here, they're being used, um, they're present. Uh, on and off the continent. So if this is not kind of a debate that you're concerned about. It's definitely something that, that you should be. Um, fifth and final threat comes from the spread of disinformation. And un unfortunately, uh, uh, both the human brain and today's global information networks are wired such that narratives that are bloody, galling, surprising, and deceitful spread faster than those that are reasoned and evidence-based. And this makes it much easier for malicious actors of all kind to spread what seem to be compelling but often verifiably false narratives that stoke divisions, violence, conflict, corruption, and authoritarianism. And they can have deeply destabilizing consequences. Um, according to recent uh, Africa Center for Strategic Studies research, disinformation campaigns have targeted every region of the continent, at least 37 African countries have been the target of a specific disinformation campaign, and nearly 60% of these campaigns are sponsored by foreign states. Okay, so what do we do about it? Uh, next slide. I think, I think we're kind of in a cycle where you see rapid technological diffusion, uh, unintended harms and consequences, or sometimes intended harms and consequences, and what, what what determines whether or not the technology is ultimately a force for good or bad, it comes down to how it's used, and it comes down to how it's governed by the international community, by the private sector, and by government and security sector uh, officials. And um, I think w the story in Africa, sure, Africa is the least digitized region in the world, maybe compared to other regions, doesn't quite have the same level of policy infrastructure and architecture, but I actually think there has been a lot of progress over the past decade. Um, most African countries now have some kind of cybersecurity legislation in place. Most have a national computer emergency response team. Many are establishing agencies or are, are establishing national cybersecurity strategies. Um, we recently, a few weeks ago, held a workshop in Mauritius that made it clear that the question isn't just anymore about cyber capacity building. It's really how do you align the architecture that already exists into a more coherent, coordinated framework. Um, nevertheless, I think there's still very significant challenges. Um, first of all, with implementing the policies that are already on the books, um, the African Union has what's known as the Malibu Convention on Personal Security and Data Protection. It is supposed to be one continental framework for, uh, for, for cybersecurity and, and, and uh, cooperation. 
It's only been ratified by 16 countries, so a third of the continent after 10 years in existence. Uh, the African Union was the first region in the world to pass a common Afri a African position on the implementation of international law to cyberspace, a tremendous achievement, but now it's got to be implemented, right? Uh, it's not worth the piece of paper that's written on unless it's implemented. Uh, second, next slide, um, national implementation. Um, so this is from a, a piece of research I did with the African Union expert group chair, Abdul Hakim Ajijola, where we basically assessed every country that had a national cybersecurity strategy at the time. And we looked at whether it had an accurate threat assessment, whether it contained resource allocations, uh, 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 whether it had a plan of action, whether it assigned responsibilities, whether it had a timeline. We found that, that most African cyber cybersecurity strategies neither contained an assessment of the threats, which if you don't add, know your threat landscape, you cannot devise context-specific policies to deal with them. And they also didn't contain an allocation of resources, which is equally important when you're trying to implement a strategy. You have to be able to find means to actually make the strategy a reality. Um, a third and final challenge I would say is that while you, I think, do have a fair amount of cyber capacity in the private sector and in the civilian government institutions, the security sector remains very behind the curve and in, in need of, I think, greater cyber capabilities, but also capabilities that I think are, 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 are used efficiently. Um, so when I, when I, when I, I, I want to I leave you with kind of three kind of main um, uh, implications specific to you as security sector actors to kind of help you think about your role in this space. Um, next slide. Um, so, so first, um, as I said earlier, uh, the threats are only likely to accelerate with increases in internet penetration and advances in technology. Um, when I started the Africa Center in 2019, I think I correctly identified that, that drones was gonna be increasingly integrated into surveillance intelligence and combat systems everywhere, and I think that's what's happening. If you ask to ask me what, what next technology I'm worried about, it's artificial intelligence. I think we're gonna see very rapid diffusion of artificial intelligence into military decisions, decision support systems, intelligence processes of all kinds. It's already there in some respects. Um, the second kind of big implication, I think, for you is that the unconventional nature of the threat demands an unconventional response. And not just because cyber threats transcends boundaries, but because the only way to really confront them is cooperation between a variety of stakeholders. Um, civilians and, and companies and enterprises who have the technical expertise often make your best cyber warriors, not necessarily people who are in a military or, or traditional government enterprise. In fact, if you're talking about protecting critical infrastructure, um, Security sector actors can actively harm the trust that's needed to get uh, government actors around the table with the private sector actors, the tech companies, the financial companies who own and operate most of the world's digitally dependent infrastructure. So you need an agency who's going to be trusted uh, by then. And I think uh, you know one, one kind of key theme you see, be it in cybersecurity or disinformation, um, openness and transparency is your friend. Uh, closed systems and a lack of accountability is your enemy, right? So whatever you can do to foster openness, trust, and transparency is ultimately, I think, going to serve your country's interests, your national security, and it means a different, different approach. Um, final, like, concluding thoughts here is, you know, we're living in a time of rapid technological change. Um, data has become the new oil, and cyber is not only kind of a new contested domain, but it is a domain that is becoming increasingly critical to the functioning of all the other domains. Um, no one can fully anticipate how rapid advances in communication technology will impact the security landscape for decades to come, but it's clear that the decisions you make are going to be very consequential, carry profound promise, but, but also great risk. And I, I do believe it is in your power as security sector leaders um, to ensure that the digital revolution does not go like the industrial one, and that it facilitates a future for Africa that is more independent, more prosperous, and more peaceful. Thank you.